there people and welcome to the Logum Effort Electronics channel. I promised you a pile of them. And here they are. The world famous record breaking platform still thriving today. The Commodore 64. Now these are all donor machines. So they have given their parts away to save the life of others. And it's time to pay back. Now there are three machines in here and they all have the newer style case and not the bread bin version that was inherited from the VIC-20. And that also means statistically that they should have the short board, the smaller board with more integrated components. Fewer but more integrated. But the fact is the Commodore 64 you can never trust what's in it until you open it. And we can already tell here from the pile that there is a uh, an older board sticking out. And actually the first batches of the Commodore 64C actually had the same board as the last of the bread bins. So we'll see what we find in here. Over the course of a few episodes I will try to get one or maybe two of these working and I'm gonna need some tools, specifically the dead test cartridge, which is very helpful in this situation. I'm going to try to build my own cartridge. Now there was a day when I etched my own circuit boards, but that's never gonna happen again. Five circuit boards from a professional manufacturer, six bucks shipped. I can't even buy a bucket for that money. So I found this open source design on GitHub called the Versa 64 cart made by BWAC. And it's an excellently simple design to make a generic cartridge that you can strap in any type of ROM configuration. And as you can see, the, I mean, this is excellent. Uh, I can't, I can't even begin to get anywhere close to this on my own. So to get the cartridge running, we need uh, the board. We need uh, some diodes and some resistors. Uh, we need dip switches and a reset switch and some pin headers. Actually we don't need all of this. We could use uh, the board to make a hardwired cartridge strapped for what we need, but I'm planning to make this one configurable and this is what's so good about the Versa 64 cart. Now on this website, the world of Jani, uh, you can find all the diagnostic cartridges available to download with the manual and the ROM file and uh, there's really very little work in in getting this running and anyone could do it with a little bit of soldering and the right tools the priciest one probably being the eprom burner so the cartridge is now ready and we're gonna set the switches and jumpers in the way the dead test cartridge wants it now a normal game it would be configured very different from this because uh, the kernel rom in the computer would start up first and then detect the cartridge and start loading the game from it or the application. But the dead test cartridge actually replaces the kernel ROM and some nifty programming in this dead test cartridge makes it possible to run it without components that the kernel would need, for example, functioning RAM. So let's program this EEPROM with the dead test application and start troubleshooting. Now there are some really puzzling things about the power supply. I have two of them actually. And this is the more modern style and they are, first of all, welded together and they are also filled up with resin or glue or something. There's no air inside here. And I can't understand why anyone would do things like this. It's, it's very, very weird because of course you, you prevent tampering. You also possibly prevent I don't know, counterfeiting, and uh, not really. That, that's never stopped anyone anyway. And I mean, the intellectual property, it's a power supply. The intellectual property value of this one is like a bag of carrots. So, I don't know. But to give you a quick rundown on how a power supply works, or well, this one in particular, it takes the voltage from your wall socket down to 9 volts, and then it takes the 9 volts AC, rectifies it, and puts it through a voltage regulator. And the voltage regulator takes 
whatever voltage is put into it and outputs five of those to the computer and the rest it dumps to ground, which generates a lot of heat. And Commodore has also done something that the manufacturer of the voltage regulator actually explicitly said, don't do this. They have used a resistor on the ground pin of the regulator to lift it a little bit higher above ground, which means it outputs a little more than 5 volts to compensate, probably, for the loss in the cable to the computer. But by doing this, you risk losing the connection to ground, and that's one of many reasons why the regulator might start outputting a lot more voltage than it should. This will fry the circuits in your Commodore. Now there are protection devices that you plug in between the computer and the power supply that can help in this situation. And it breaks the power if the voltage is too high. I've measured both of mine here and they're roughly 5.2 volts out, which is acceptable. A little high but acceptable. And uh, about 10 volts on the AC line. So I think we're good to go. I also made a connector to get some video output uh, to my capture card and we have the dead test cartridge. So let's get on with the troubleshooting. The first one, exhibit A, I guess we can call it, is a little bit rare actually. We, we uh, have a Swedish keyboard and that was not very common even in Sweden. So um, yeah, we'll see what we find in here. Plastic is a little bit yellowed, but uh, everything seems to be intact. Actually, the keyboard brackets are missing, but that's no problem. We have the cardboard shield. I'm going to have to get rid of that. Well, I'll write an A here to know that it's computer number A. The motherboard is loose. Okay, sure. Yeah, well, I'm not surprised. I am surprised a little bit about this board though, because uh, I wasn't expecting this board to be in this computer. I'll, um, I'll tell you more about that later. Uh, no, I'm not, I'm not going to take it out. This cardboard has to go away, because this is a very good insulator. And the chips die from either over voltage, internal corrosion, or heat. For example here, the SID chip and the PLA chip. They seem original, and I don't have much hope for them, to be honest. This is a donor board, and uh, these chips are the first ones to break, so... The VIC chip is probably okay here in the metal shield, but the others... It's only logical that they are actually broken. The Swedish ROM chips here are a bit rare, actually. And it's also a problem for compatibility. And uh, that's why many people prefer the English version. We have eight RAM chips. And the long board in the early C64C didn't have eight RAM chips. So this motherboard is for an older revision. And I see two reasons for this. Either it's been donated to another computer and this is actually a broken card, or it has been given a new board in a warranty repair early in its life, where they actually just swapped out the board for whatever was repaired on the shelf and they didn't want to waste the customer's time too much. So let's start it up and see what happens. Well, nothing, I think, is the right word for this. Yeah. Oh, we're going to need to do some more troubleshooting before we get any result out of this one. Behold the dead test cartridge. We'll plug it in and uh, we'll see if we can get some more information out of this one. One, two, three, four. And according to the manual for the dead test cartridge, that means that either one of the four RAM chips are broken or we have a stuck data line on the memory bus. And, well, we know that this is probably not the freshest of computers, so I'm going to remove yeah, the SID chip here. The SID chip is warm and the PLA is fine. The SID chip feels very warm. So I'll, I'll remove it because it's not really necessary to have the SID chip in the computer. It'll run anyway, but you won't get any sound. And hey, we have the dead test application running. And it's doing its tests. It'll take a little while to get through them all. But we can safely say that this SID chip that we had in here was 
not uh, in good shape. The dead test is having a bit of a rave right now. Uh, the colors are all uh, mixed up and jumping around, and this is a very, uh, very common error, and it can uh, be caused by one of two things: either the PLA chip or the color ASRAM. And here we can see that the test actually says that the color ASRAM is bad, but it also says that a lot of RAM chips are bad. So I don't really trust it right now. I think I'll go for the PLA first. And I actually have this uh, modern replacement for the PLA. The PLA chip is sort of the gatekeeper of what uh, bit of the memory is available to the CPU. And with a modern PLA replacement, uh, we should... Okay, we don't actually get any different result so far. Uh, let the test go through and see if we see any difference at least. And actually we do see a difference. The the RAM, it says a different... Now, now it says that different RAM chips are bad. So uh, I'll go on ahead and replace the color RAM also. It's a very simple fix, so it's probably worth it. And I actually have a couple of spares. So let's see if it does any good. All right. Well, the rave is over. For sure, it looks good. Um, I'll make the test go through and see, yeah, it passed the complete cycle. So uh, this machine is good to go. It was a bit more to replace than I thought. Um, actually, no, when I think about it, it was probably more along the lines of what I actually had imagined. I'll put the old PLA back again. Just, okay, yeah, we're getting the right colors again, but I don't think it'll last very long. I'd be very surprised if this one is actually working. But, nah, no, no, we're starting to see everything breaking down. The color SRAMs is bad again. Maybe the PLA was even the cause of the, the broken color SRAM. So I'll leave this one for now, and I will get started with Exhibit B. And it's not as yellow as the other one. It also has an English keyboard. So I trust this one better for, for compatibility. The keyboard sits better in this one. Uh, so yeah, it, it has the brackets in place, so that's better. It is strange though, this is the same revision motherboard as before. Uh, so I'm confused here. We're missing some circuits, we're missing the color as RAM and the PLA. So uh, we'll go ahead and replace those. We have uh, another color as RAM and we have the PLA replacement. And uh, the SID chip is already in there. Hopefully it's working. Ah, no, it can't be working. But we'll at least see if it stops us from booting. We'll plug it in. And switch the power on. Okay, that was too easy. That was way too easy. I, uh, yeah, well, this is definitely a repairable computer. And I won't bother with the dead test cartridge right now. Because, I mean, we're here, so we, we can't really, uh, we don't really need to test anymore. We need a PLA and we need to check if the SID chip is working, but uh, we'll do that at a later time. Let's, uh, let's put this one away for now and uh, get started with the third one. This one is missing a keyboard, but we can see from the cutout here that... Yeah, this is actually the short board, and this is the board we were expecting in the other two also. And this short board has fewer components on it. That's because much of the logic was incorporated into this super PLA, which is uh, a souped up version of the old PLA, and also a lot more durable, because it was manufactured with a different technique. And uh, some chips are the same as the old board. We have the the CIA chips here, one of them socketed here and one of them soldered in. And of course the VIC and CPU is the same and uh, we have a SID chip, although a newer revision than in the older boards. 
So uh, at this point, I think we just uh, fire it up and see what happens. And yeah, as you can see, the SID chip is missing in this one also. I'm not surprised. All right, this is a very different error, but it's still a very definite error. And uh, to know exactly what's going on here, I mean, there's so much documentation on the Commodore 64. Everything that is to know is known more or less. So, um, well, I'll, I'll put the dead test cartridge in. I, I don't expect any other result really. But uh, to diagnose a problem on the Commodore 64, there are some very good tools to do that. And for example, the flashing colors we had with the uh, color SRAM and the broken PLA on the previous ones, we can find these errors in troubleshooting manuals on the web with pictures. And the Pictorial C64 Fault Guide is an excellent one, which has a huge amount of examples on how a specific error can look. And if we browse down, we can see an error that looks exactly like ours, and it claims to be the U2 chip, the CIA over here, which has a, a companion over here, U1. These are identical. Um, the chips are exactly the same, but they have different purpose. So what we can do, we can swap them over and see the error move. For example, the graphical error we see here, that would uh, disappear, but it would be replaced by an error, uh, for example, that uh, allows us to, that, that prevents us from, from using the keyboard. But the Pictorial C64 troubleshooting guide here and, and others like it is a very excellent tool that we didn't have back in the 80s when these machines were breaking down. So what I need to do now is something I'm not looking particularly forward to, but uh, I will desolder, desolder uh, U2 and I will swap it over for the U1 and see if we can have a definitive uh, truth about uh, what the problem is. So take the board out, it's just a few screws, that's not a big issue. And uh, then uh, try to uh, desolder these 40 pins. Now I really suggest you use a heated solder pump or at least heat from one side and solder or, or pump from the other. But I'm going to use hot air instead because, um, well, I, I'm a bit lazy. It's not going to pay off though because it's going to take a lot of effort getting the holes clean. But uh, I'll do it this way to make sure I get the chip out safely. And then I will heat from one side and pump from the other. Uh, to make sure I get the holes perfectly clean. I'll even drill a little bit out here because uh, it, it looked like I couldn't get it really perfectly clean. And I put the socket in there and I'll solder that in place. So the chip should have been fairly safe with this treatment and uh, after soldering the socket in place here I will try it out in the same position as before just to make sure that we're getting the same problem. And so far it looks exactly like before, so there is no reason to uh, be suspicious about this chip. Now it's time to swap them over and see if the error moves. And I think we have a success there. Now by swapping this broken chip into U1, we can expect the keyboard not to work. But to be very sure now that the chip is actually not working, we can run the dead test cartridge because in the dead test cartridge we have um, two clocks. Because the CIA chips both contain something called uh, the time of day counter, which is really a time since power on. But uh, because there are two chips and they both have a counter in them, we can see if they are synchronized or not. The dead test cartridge show this at the bottom of the screen and uh, this gives us a very easy way to see that, that one of the CIA chips are not behaving as it should right now. And that concludes the assessment of the 3 Commodore 64s and marks the start of a series of episodes about the Commodore 64, how the platform is still thriving today and what you can do with it that you could not do in the 80s. So I think this exhibit B here is probably the one that is most repairable, 
but maybe the Swedish one and the more modern card is the logical choice to go for. So we'll see what happens. Oh, well, thank you for watching. Uh, sorry about the long episode. Uh, I thought it was better to keep this together than to split it up in, in more parts. Please subscribe. And if you want to support my channel, check out my Patreon page. And thank you for your consideration. Hello. Hi, this is Mr. Random Person. Was that ship working or not? Well...